I love my duvet. In the winter, I get a nice thick duvet and I wrap it around me and keep myself really warm. And then, when the weather starts warming up about April, May time, I switch it for a more appropriate, thinner summer duvet. I don't want to get too hot. And then, when it gets to the really hot part of summer, so July, I don't bother with a duvet at all, I just sleep under a sheet. Now, why am I talking to you about duvets? Well, our planet effectively has a duvet. And it's made up of carbon dioxide and methane, gases such as those. And it's just the right thickness around the planet to keep us at a brilliant temperature. So it's rather like October, November in my thick duvet. It's just the right thickness to keep me warm. Well, it used to be. The trouble is that we started discovering coal, oil, and natural gas. And we started burning them. And as we started burning them, that perfect duvet around the Earth got thicker and thicker and thicker. Now, I don't know how you feel when you take an inappropriate duvet and try and sleep under something that's too hot. I tend to sweat. I get uncomfortable. I thrash around. I can't sleep. Eventually, I pitch the duvet off the bed. I feel a lot better. I get a good night's sleep. Our Earth can't do that. It doesn't have the option of getting rid of this really thick duvet that we've put around it. We're finding that it's acting out. And instead of sweating or thrashing, what it's doing is we're seeing melting ice caps. We're seeing the extinction of masses of insect species. We're seeing animal species going extinct. We're seeing mass migration, starvation in some places. People are calling this a climate emergency, a climate breakdown. So what do we do about it? We have a global problem. We need a global solution. On an individual level, there's some great advice out there. You can fly less. You could swap driving for public transport, for walking, for cycling. You can plant a garden. You can recycle. That's a really easy one. These are all things that we can do to decrease our own carbon dioxide emissions, to stop that blanket from getting any, that duvet from getting any thicker at all. But this only decreases the amount going into the atmosphere, and it only deals with a personal level. We have a global problem that needs a global solution. We have a global problem that needs many global solutions. And one of those that we're hearing about is called direct air capture. So direct air capture is where we take a filter and we put it in a big open space. And what happens is we have air that goes through that filter. The filter traps the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And then we can collect the carbon dioxide into a container and we can reuse that filter multiple times. And this is a way of taking carbon dioxide that's already got into our air out. Now, why haven't we seen this deployed on a global scale? Why don't we see direct air capture on every building, every household, every industrial plant around the world? Well, at the moment, it's not economically viable. So to capture one ton of carbon dioxide costs about $600. That's quite a lot of money. What can you sell that for? It varies from country to country, but you're looking at about $200, $300 per ton of carbon dioxide. So you've spent 600 to capture it. You can only sell it for 300. You can see why this isn't being deployed at the moment. So what if we could take this carbon dioxide that we've captured and turn it into something that's worth a lot more money? That would be quite a clever thing to do. So this is what I'm working on, and num a number of people around the world are working on. So what we can do is we can use a process called electrochemical reduction, which I'll explain in a minute, to take our carbon dioxide coupled with some renewable electricity that we can get from the national grid, and turn our carbon dioxide into products that have a higher value. So these products are things like formic acid, sodium acetate, ethylene, and propanol. What can we do with those? So formic acid is used as a cleaning product, so you could clean your toilet with it. Sodium acetate is used to preserve food because it prevents mold growth on food. You can use it as a pickling agent. Ethylene is used in blowtorches in welding. And it's also the starting material for a lot of plastics that we need. You may even have a plastic bottle that you're drinking from right now. Propanol has a high octane number, and it burns much more cleanly than petrol and diesel. 
So it is something that we could potentially use in cars in the future. So how do we get there? Okay, so the red and the black rectangles are called electrodes. So they carry that electrical charge that we're getting from the grid. This is our renewable energy that's going around this circuit. We then have a bicarbonate solution, that's the water, and we bubble our carbon dioxide in through the solution. So the carbon dioxide bubbles come in, they touch the electrode, and then they're converted into one of the products that I was talking about earlier. So that might be <coughs> ethylene, it might be formic acid. Now what happens is this is quite an energy intensive process and we don't want to be spending more energy than we have to. So we use something called a catalyst. So a catalyst makes reactions easier. They make sure that we don't need as much energy to do them. And in our case, our catalyst is copper. We want as much of the carbon dioxide to touch the copper as we possibly can. And so we make what's called a porous copper foam. And it basically means, you can imagine a foam, and it basically means that the copper has lots of different holes in it. And you can imagine, if you look at the picture, the carbon dioxide coming in and out of all those holes and channels. And as it hits the surface, as it hits the side of the copper, it gets converted into one of these products. So we can change the structure of our catalyst to make different products more favorable. And so this is one that I've been working on for the last year. And you can see that at the top of the structure, we have these cube-like objects, and they're called cube octahedra. And then as we start cutting away through the layers of the catalyst, you can see that the structure changes. And so the next layer, the middle picture, shows you a load of stick-type things with these cube octahedra. And those stick-type things are called dendrites. And then finally, as we cut away all the way to the bottom of the foam, you can see that we've got a lot of cube octahedra and a couple of dendrites. And in these structure changes, that'll affect how that carbon dioxide interacts and forms different products. And what we think is that these cube octahedra allow lots of carbon atoms to join together. And so this one is, uh, it will preferentially select for propanol, which I said we could use in cars in the future. Now that would make it a really valuable product to use. This is a copper foam that my predecessor, Sonny Khan, made. And so you can see picture A, there's lots of spiky dendrites. And then picture B, there's, the shape is a lot more rounded. It looks like we've joined a lot of footballs together. And so by changing the structure, this one doesn't make propanol, but it will make ethylene. So ethylene was the, the one used for welding, or it could be used for plastic bottles and that sort of thing. And so the difference between A and B is that we've changed the structure, and now with B, we can make double the amount of ethylene than with than we can make with A, with, um, with A. And the value of this is $500 per ton. So now you can see that we've gone from carbon dioxide at two to $300 per ton to ethylene at $500 per ton. These are just two examples of how we can make something that the world wants and is a lot more valuable than the climate changing hazardous carbon dioxide that we're currently emitting. So why did I want to come and share this with you today? Well, as UK taxpayers, a portion of your money goes to the Welsh European Funding Organisation and the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Both of those have contributed funding to make the research that I've just presented to you happen. So you're already part of this research just by paying your taxes. So thank you very much for that. The second thing is that as we have these frightening conversations about what our future is going to look like as we grapple to, to understand the effect of the climate breakdown. I want you to know that there are people all around the world working on technological solutions. The thing is, that's not enough. We need a completely holistic approach to solving the climate emergency. And that means conversations on every level in every subject about what we do about this. So I want to invite you all to be part of the solution. I'd like you to talk about what you've heard here today and to talk about what you can do to be part of that solution, to decrease the amount of carbon dioxide that you are putting into the atmosphere so that this really thick duvet that the Earth can no longer cope with doesn't have to get any thicker. Thank you very much. <laughs>